Cool. Welcome there, Chris Betcher. Uh, it's so good to see your smiley face today, bud. Um, thank you for joining me on the Ridiculously Human podcast. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here, man. I, I really appreciate the invites and I'm glad we were able to connect again after a, a few months of, uh, I know you've you've been busy with the family and and we've been busy doing some things on, on our end. And so it, it's great to be able to, to connect face to face here again. Yeah, but it's it's super cool, man. Um, I mean, we had a chat ages ago. I think it must have been like close to two years, maybe, you know, like we connected on Twitter and then uh, you said, hey, how's it going? Let's have a call. I was like, wow, this is cool. Um, and then we had a call and um, yeah, it's been a while since then. So, you know, and I even I like even after that, I was like, hey, man, we should we should do a podcast. And then I realized, oh, you actually having a baby soon. Let me give this guy a bit of room. And, um, you know, now I think the little one's about 10 months old. So so there's a bit more more time in your life, maybe <laughs> or maybe not <laughs> to have chats like these. Yeah, she's given us uh, three nights in a row uh, of straight sleep, so that's that's always a blessing. And uh, fortunately, the two older ones haven't haven't disturbed that either. So it's it, I feel like I'm a, I'm a new man after three complete nights of sleep. It's it's been a long time since that's happened. Oh man, that sounds like heaven, but <laughs> uh, classic. So it's funny uh, we were talking just before this started about uh, the pronunciation of your surname, right? And um, to, so it's obviously it's spelled B O E T T C H E R, right? And and the first four letters of that in Afrikaans, which is a language that we speak in South Africa, uh, is pronounced but, right? And um, but means brother. And I was like, wow, that's so cool because you run a group uh, for men with your brother, and your surname is Butcher. I was like, ah, oh, I bet he doesn't know it means brother in in in, in Afrikaans. So it's quite a cool thing, I thought. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. The only th it's, it's a German, uh, German heritage. And I, I thought it was something simple uh, in, in German. It means barrel maker. So it's definitely a lot cooler to, uh, to have the brother uh, connection than just something simple. Like, although growing up in Wisconsin, uh, there, there was, there was plenty of, of beer barrels uh, consumed over the years. So it's, it's a, bar a bit of a cultural thing, I'm sure going back to, uh, to our heritage. <laughs> that's classic man um so so when we were when we first caught up um it was like we were almost i guess both kind of like starting our, our journey on twitter and uh you you have like just exploded like i mean you now have one hundred and twenty two thousand followers on twitter um and i also know from listening to other podcasts that you don't necessarily like enjoy social media so how are you finding kind of like that having that sort of following and, and being in the spotlight so to speak yeah, it's a it's a balancing act. Uh, I mean, if I'm being honest, it's it's definitely Brett and I, my brother, we talk about this all the time. Is is it's a uh, it's definitely out of our comfort zones. We don't like talking about ourselves all that much. It feels you know very uncomfortable. It's getting easier every day, but uh, just trying to find the balance where you know we can still have those those deep connections, and that's where having the opportunity to work with our clients it's really what we enjoy the most because we're able to to connect on a deeper level and. Um, sometimes the, the Twitter side of it, the social media side of it tends to stay more superficial and you can still provide, you know, a lot of value and, and great, meet some great people like yourself. But, uh, you know, I still have to find the opportunity to find boundaries with that because it, it can definitely become consuming very quickly. And, uh, at the end of the day, I think both of us continue to kind of lean back on our foundation, you know, the physical therapy side, we're used to working one-on-one -on -one with people and, so being able to work with clients is still by far the most fulfilling part of our day. And then, you know, utilizing the things that we're learning, the things that we're, we're you know, helping clients uh, you know, get to results with. And we just are able to share that with a wider audience and um, still be able to help people that even we, even if we don't have the opportunity to connect with them, you know, each and every day uh, on an individual basis. So, yeah, it's it's fun. It's it's really hard to believe how much, you know, things have even changed since you and I connected probably 18 or 20 months ago uh, to where they are today and just kind of taking it one day at a time because uh, it's, it's, it's quite, it's been quite the ride. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess it sort of shows the need for, for what you're doing, you know, like in terms of guys craving community guys craving solid information from like a reputable source, because there's a lot of rubbish information out there. So, so I guess it says a lot about you and your brother and what you guys are doing. So, so it's really cool, man. Um, I was, I was just wondering, like you, you have, I think two other brothers as well. You've got, there's four of you and you're the oldest. What, what was it like, bud, growing up with, with four of you? It must've been, it must've been pretty cool. I think. 
Yeah, I mean, it was a war zone. I'm not going to lie. It, you know, I was the oldest. Brett's actually the youngest. Uh, we're, we're a little over six years apart. So, yeah, there was there was uh, there was a good stretch of time where, you know, even when I was in like early teens through through high school, where all of us were in, you know, tons and tons of sports. And I think that's really foundational to where a lot of the the competitive side came out, the health side that we, you know, kind of drew that interest from. And, but yeah, I, I say it was a war zone. We always joke around that growing up in Wisconsin. The only reason none of us, believe it or not, ever had a broken bone between the four of us is because of all that milk we probably consumed, uh, all the cheese we consumed. It just uh, allowed, allowed that bone density to to uh, go to the next level. But yeah, it was fun. I mean, there was there was never a dull moment in our house. I don't know how my parents did it, you know, looking at it with now having three. Fortunately, I've got two much calmer girls in between or I'm kind of sandwiching a, a very uh, rambunctious uh, little three-year-old boy, but uh, I don't know how they did four boys. I have no idea. And um, I'm not sure I want to ever uh, get to that level. That was, it, it, we definitely put our parents through hell. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> and do your parents speak about it much like these days? Do they tell you like, you know, what it was really like? Yeah. When, especially when I share stories with them about what our kids are doing now, they just kind of like nod along, give me a big smile. And it's like, yeah, you, you kind of reap what you sow. You know, those are, those are, you know, half of that, half of that child is you. And we certainly had, you know, plenty of stories just like that. Um, and again, times four, I can't even imagine. I can imagine like sitting down at the dinner table was like, okay, just a, a free for all sort of thing. You had to, you had to be quite competitive as to if you could get, you know, to get as much as you food as you could possibly in your mouth. Oh yeah. And, and fighting over who got, you know, who got an extra piece of this or who got an extra piece of that. And yeah, there was, there was plenty of arguments and, and, you know, maybe not fist fights, but close to fist fights over uh, just whose, whose food, whose play had a little bit more of something on it. <laughs> That's classic. And so you mentioned sports and stuff like, like what sort of sports were, were you guys all playing as youngsters? Man, we played everything. Uh, there wasn't really a time. I mean, I, I actually ended up playing five sports still in high school. Um, all of my brothers played at least two. So well, I would say our true passion was probably basketball. Number one, we're all pretty tall guys. Brett's actually kind of, we always call him the, the freak of the family. He's actually six, seven, and the rest of us are all between six, one and, and six, three. So we, we, we definitely spent a ton of time on the court, um, and then, you know, excelled in the endurance side of things. So, um, you know, did, did the track side of things, played some baseball, played some football, and, um, uh, but yeah, I'd say for me, track and field and, and basketball were my two, my two strengths. And the first time I ever played basketball was actually in America. I went and I did a camp in, uh, in New York state and we, like between, you know, like when the kids would have their basketball sort of session for the day, like I would definitely be there, but then like also between like lunches and, and sleep time and stuff, uh, it was such a cool thing to play. Like, you know, I mean many countries don't even have it. You know what I mean? Like I grew up in South Africa and, and it was definitely not a sport we had at school or anywhere really. So it's, it's a really like, it's a fun sport. It's, it requires a lot of like agility and strength and that you don't necessarily have in, in other sports. Yeah. And I think it translates. I mean, I'm, I'm biased again, it's my favorite sport, but you know, you put this the high level of skill with the, the agility, the strength component that's required and, yeah. And even like from a cardiovascular standpoint, I mean, you're, you're just going, you're going pretty much nonstop. So it's, I, I love it. I think it's the most balanced sport out there. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll hang on to that till the day I die. I think the best athletes in the world are, are basketball players uh, being able, you know, I think about guys who are, you know, like LeBron James, who's out there at six, eight, six, nine, being able to move the, his body the way he does. You just, that doesn't translate to, uh, you know, any other sport where you, you're, you're going to have a lot more of a, of a very specific body type. Whereas basketball players, I think their sport kind of translates to pretty much anything else. You throw some of these guys on, on just about any other uh, sporting event, hand them a, a ball and, and they're going to be able to excel with it. Yeah. I think it's like any supporter, you know, or any person that has played a sport in their life, they always go like, no, yeah, our sport is the best sport and, and they're the toughest or whatever. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, um, there's just literally been the, the world cup uh, rugby uh, and, uh, and South Africa actually won the world cup for, for a record fourth time. And I mean, yeah, I mean, those guys are extremely physical and, um, it, it's just amazing seeing like how also sports have sort of, um, changed over the years 
Um, I don't know if it's been much the same for basketball, like have the, you know, maybe the, the skills changed or the, the sort of makeup of their players, the players in terms of their heights, their, their strength, their muscle mass, has that changed much for basketball? Definitely. And, and I think the game has also been adapted to, you know, I think back growing up, I was a, I'm a big Michael Jordan fan and the game back then was so much more physical than it is today. And so what, what's being allowed now, I think that in some cases, along with the three point line, you know, it's allowed guys like Steph Curry, who, you know, now is basically one of the faces of the NBA at, you know, six foot tall, probably. And, you know, a guy like him, he probably would have got the snot kicked out of him 20 years ago. They just, they wouldn't have allowed him to, to do everything that he does just because the game would have just, you know, put so much extra wear and tear on his body. And so there's, there's some of that going on too, that the game has changed the three point line. You know, you, you don't need as, as big physical bodies down low. And so now it allows more of that, that guard heavy, um, you know, six foot to six, five player to excel as opposed to, you know, putting out a bunch of seven footers and just letting them bang around. I like that saying, you got the snot kicked out of him. Is that what you said? <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a great one i can just you can just see it happening sort of thing <laughs> um so you, you touched on it uh you you just got you got three kids now and like i, I was wondering what is it like having like a, a third edition does it like does, do things just get crazy and like much more unmanageable or is it actually easier you know i think we're we're fortunately at a spot now where our our oldest is almost six she's getting more helpful and our youngest is very, very chill. And I think that's because since she was born, you know, she's had to deal with two other siblings and our, our, uh, our little boy, he's, he's something else in terms of just, he's always been the wild card. Uh, and so he's used to just having her, or excuse me, she's used to having him just always into something, always causing trouble. And so she just kind of like goes with the flow and she's, she's been a good sleeper. She's honestly been a better sleeper than her brother. Even when she was, you know, three or four months old, we were still probably getting up more often with him than her. So it, uh, it hasn't been that much of a transition. I'm not sure how it would have been, you know, if we would have had two pretty calm kids to get started with and then throw the third one in, that was uh, a bit more chaotic. Uh, but for us, it's, it's been, my, my wife's great. She, uh, you know, she, she's not afraid to, she's a night we balance each other out really well. I think that's the that's the key is, you know, sometimes it can be, it can be tough functioning, especially running a business from the house. Um, but she does a great job of, of taking pressure off of me. And um, she's, she's fortunate enough to be able to stay home with them. So um, being able to give them that direct, you know, that direct time every day and run them around a little bit when necessary. And so it's, it's been great. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have it any other way. It's, it's fantastic. I think it's very difficult to like almost quantify uh, how, what's the right way to say it? Like how, I guess, powerful, how important um, and life-changing it is uh, for parents to be actually uh, based at home uh, when their children uh, grow up and especially at that young age, you know, like instead of uh, carting them off to like a crash or, or whatever it is, you know, like to actually have that um, oversight and that, that parents uh, figure close to them for those early years is, I, I, I think it's, it's kind of is life-changing. Yeah, no question about it. And, you know, it's, it requires sacrifice. Don't get me wrong. I mean, we've, we made a conscious decision after she was working when our first was born and um, after she was teaching at the time. And after the, I think about, she went back after her maternity leave and uh, about three months to finish out the school year. And we just decided, you know, we we're going to make some sacrifices to make this work. And um, she's, she's been home since then. So it's, it's not easy. There's definitely days where I think for both of us, we'd love to be able to maybe have a little bit more of a break once in a while, have a little bit more time for just the two of us. But at the end of the day, like we, we are going to define our kids' future based off of, you know, our values and the things that we're teaching them. And we've, we've taken it a step further this year with our oldest is now doing kind of a homeschool hybrid. So she, she goes to school a couple of days a week. And then we have the curriculum all the time that if, if she's not able to go because we're, we're gone someplace visiting family or whatever that is, we can continue to kind of stay up with it on our own. And, and then my wife takes care of a, a couple of days a week of the curriculum herself. And yeah, it just comes back to, we know what's being taught and we can really see, you know, her just come alive because we're involved with that curriculum uh, day in and day out. And it also allows us to, I don't know, kind of brush up on some of our skills. There's a lot of stuff that even at, you know, five, almost six, 
she's being taught right now that it's like, yeah, it's, it's surprising that I actually had to kind of like think about that a little bit. So it's, it, we're excited about it and, and we can see that. And again, I don't know how the, it's different everywhere. There's different parts. There's good schools, bad schools everywhere. But, you know, for us, we kind of looked around at the the surrounding area and we just decided, you know, I think for us to take control of our kids' education is one of the best things we could possibly do to, you know, be able to to make sure that they're in a good spot going forward and and then being able to have the opportunity to introduce them to some more experiences going forward that aren't necessarily tied to the the school year, uh, because that certainly creates some barriers. And, you know, I can I can now work from anywhere. So we, we'd love to be able to just kind of build experiences into their lives. And I can work from, like I said, virtually anywhere and, and allow them to just build as many opportunities for us to, to have memories together as a family as possible. I think it's amazing. And uh, you're just going to have kids that are so worldly, you know, especially the fact if you can like give them those experiences and it's out of states or out of country or whatever, it's a, uh, it is really amazing. I, I've, I've traveled a fair bit of the world and actually on, on a lot of those travels, I've met families that like are homeschooling their kids while they travel. And like, I remember meeting some of these kids in, in youth hostels and, and like having a chat to them and they, they were like 12, 13. And I was like, you are clever. You know what I mean? Like they were, they were so smart and um, so like wise because they had just had such a different um, input, you know, and experienced different things and experienced, um, I guess, something which doesn't doesn't necessarily happen at school, but they were like, you know, exposed to, to people that were much older than them. Um, and uh, I think that helps kind of like just bring them up to speed or, or make them uh, smarter, more wise, um, quicker, you know, so um, yeah, I think your kids are in for a super cool life. Yeah. And it's something that, you know, again, I wasn't exposed to a lot of travel growing up. Um, and I found that the older I got, the more impactful it was on my life, but most of it didn't start till I was, you know, 20 years old. So in my mind, it's like, if we can even expose them to a fraction uh, of opportunities going forward, you know, it just gives them an idea of what's out there. And, you know, then make, allows them to, you know, make a better decision on the destination of their life that they want to go through. And of course, just being able to, to be exposed to as many different cultures and peoples as, as possible. Um, you know, at some point, maybe we'll make a venture down and, and check out Brazil. Uh, but well, you'll be welcomed with open arms. So <laughs> that'll be great. I, I was wondering, like a father, be, becoming a father or parent um, changes you quite a lot. What have you maybe noticed or what have you learned from your kids uh, since you become a father? I would say number one is just being able to be more present in the moment. Uh, I, I certainly spent a lot of time, you know, late twenties and you know, so I, I had my first child at 31. So a little bit later than, than some people, but I, I know for me, you know, I spent a lot of time kind of focused on the future and thinking about financial security and thinking about, you know, what can I be doing next? And, just, you know, being able to step back and, and play with them and, and watch them just get excited about just the, the moments in life. That's, that's been huge for me. And I, I kind of lean on that a lot right now because, you know, we are still in that building phase of, of our business and, and just trying to figure out what our next steps are with things. And sometimes that can create a bit of a, of a distraction and an opportunity to kind of think about, okay, what should we be doing next? And you're, you're kind of always chasing that next step. And uh, I have to constantly remind myself that I need to live in the moment with my kids. And so just being able to watch them and, and take the time to, to be present with them, by far the biggest change that I've, I've experienced, because there, there's really nothing that gives us, and you know, as a dad, nothing gives you more reward than just being present with your kids. But it's, it's hard. It's almost like we're conditioned not to do that as dads. We're conditioned to provide and we're conditioned to keep chasing and kind of keep spinning that rabbit wheel. And that doesn't help us. And it certainly doesn't help our kids. And so being able to, to find that balance and, you know, kind of lean on that opportunity, whether it's, you know, playing with them in the yard or reading them books at night, like, you know, those, those are special moments that we're never going to get back. And so I'm just trying to lean into that. And that's, been by far the the most impactful thing you know since becoming a dad you you wrote something recently on twitter i think it you, you said um uh, one thing i'm working on myself and uh, with my kids is getting comfortable being bored uh what what did you mean by that 
Well, I mean, I think we're, again, we're just surrounded. I kind of touched on this a little bit with something I put out yesterday. We're just bombarded with information all day long with podcasts or, you know, driving in the car with music, you know, the, any, any waking moment where we're trying to have some kind of an input television again it's social media there's there's a thousand different ways to go with that because there's there's just always a median that's trying to like feed us information and um you know for me the the big change was just i i had a couple of hours a day between patients when i was working in home health where i just decided to turn off the radio and i'd spend you know 15 minutes here 15 minutes there in basically silence and just being able to collect my thoughts um, and that just allowed, you know, some creativity, some thinking about where the, the direction I really wanted to go. And um, it's something that, you know, with being present on social media, there's always something I could be doing, a comment I could be responding to, something I could be writing, a client I could be checking in with, whatever, that sometimes I just need to like disconnect if it's taking a walk in silence or, um, you know, in the car, you know, a lot of times we'll just, we'll just turn the music off. The kids might not necessarily like it, but just getting them to understand that they don't have to be constantly entertained. And it, it just seems to like fuel, yeah, like I was talking about a three-year-old earlier, watching him basically just like, instead of watching something on the TV or feeding him a tablet, you, you put him in a room and he just like, their, their ability to create play is unreal. You know, they just come up with some of the, the craziest things. And uh, you can just see that, you know, the wheels spinning just because they've been forced to figure things out on their own rather than be entertained by by something else. So things like that is, I guess, what I was mostly referencing. I, I was listening to a podcast recently, and uh, one of the things they spoke about was boredom and like actually how it's like a really good thing. And one of the reasons being is that it, it's a lot, it creates um, uh, creativity. Uh, so um yeah, like you, you know, because because like you said, we, we're so busy all the time. We actually don't really ever stop to to think. We don't ever stop to think about our own thoughts, and we don't really ever stop to um, have a time to be almost creative. You know, you need like a quiet time to kind of be creative and and create things and stuff. And I thought, ah, oh, that's a good reason to be bored you know, because you at least can stop and, and have a think about what's going on and what you want to create and do in the world. Yeah. And I mean, I think it, you know, it ties into then, you know, decreasing anxiety and just being able to, to be more present. And, um, and even I would think sleep quality, you know, I can't necessarily point to, you know, this research study shows that, but I, I have a, a strong suspic suspicion that those people that are taking a bit more margin and time to just reflect, they probably sleep a little better at night because they just have they have less of that busyness in their heads. And when their head hits the pillow, there's there's a bit calmer mind in place. And that really is going to carry into all, you know, all, all facets of life there, whether it's, you know, just being able to be, be more productive with your job or, you know, being in, in better metabolic health. You know, if we can, if we can have a calmer mind, it's going to take care of just about everything. It reminds me, I think you also wrote something about uh, like journaling uh, not too long ago and, journaling to me is one of those things that like you you can't necessarily quantify right but you should really be doing it because it's a way of like dumping what's ever in your mind and just getting it out of your mind onto a piece of paper into the world and creating space for 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 other things but but once again it's like and and I think that also maybe helps even with sleep you know because you, 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 you're not living in your head. You, you're actually getting what's in your head out onto paper. And I think it's a, a really beneficial thing, but it's like, it's hard to sort of quantify. Yeah. And, and I think we try to have almost like a perfect approach to journaling and there's just, it doesn't exist. It's just like, you're better off just picking up that pen and, and embracing the uneasiness that goes along with that the first time and just kind of dumping it. Like you said, brain dumping it onto paper, some days, maybe you want to talk about what's not going well. Some days you want to talk about, you know, some bit of gratitude or, or whatever, or, or even like breaking through some different problems. But yeah, just, I agree. I think it's, it's between the time alone, the journaling, I think those two can come together really, really well. And um, I think it's something that we could all benefit from, even if it's just a few minutes a day. I've been actually doing an experiment over the last four years. So I, each year I decide, okay, cool. This is how I'm going to journal and I'll do it for like a year. And, um, you know, just kind of like 
uh, trying different methods that, that other people suggest. And it's, um, yeah, it's, it's quite amazing, like, you know, how you can actually test things over such a long period of time. Um, and, um, yeah, I guess just tweak things ultimately till they get better and better. So I've, I've really found it like, it just, it's actually made me, I think, a, a more calm, um, more positive person. I'm, I'm already kind of like wired like that, but I think it's really actually helped me, I guess, in the last few years where things have been quite topsy turvy in the world to just kind of remain aligned and everything like that. Um, so, so yeah, anyway, but, um, you, uh, uh, there's to, to really kick things off, uh, you wrote another, um, really interesting post, uh, yesterday that I think maybe a lot of people can, can kind of relate to. Um, and so what you said was a few years ago, I had a horrible outlook on the world and was miserable to be around. Um, this was fueled by negativity from my inputs, uh, doom scrolling, drinking every weekend, hyper-focused on the markets, paying close attention to the news watching hours upon hours of sports. Um, so I was just kind of like wondering what like changed since then? Yeah, it's a great question. So I, I touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, at that point, I think there was a part of me, I had raced pretty competitively to fill that void for quite a number of years and then um, kind of left that behind when we got married. And, you know, with the right intentions of, you know, Ironman's a very time consuming sport and just realized, you know, I don't want my marriage and, and my kids to be basically ha have a dad that's not really there because he's too busy trying to, to train. So I was, tr you know, tried to find the balance with that, but unfortunately it kind of left that, that big void in my life. And then I tried to fill it with some of this other stuff. And again, I kind of talked about this earlier too, the, you kind of fall into the rat race and you just start kind of going through the motions of life. And, um, you know, I think that healthcare providers certainly are at a pretty high rate of burned out or a burnout. I got into it for what I thought was the right reasons, but then ultimately just, you, are, you, aren't, you just aren't taking care of patients the way you envision taking care of patients. And so there's this level of letdown that goes along with that. And you can just never feel like you're able to give anybody your best. And that I think there's a bit of like, it just steals your self-belief. And so then you just start to question, you know, my best days are behind me. You know, I, I did all this stuff in my twenties. I'm never going to be able to get back to that stuff again. And now I've got all these other responsibilities as a husband and a father. So I guess I just have to stay on the hamster wheel. And so, you know, being able to, to spend some time alone, COVID was huge for me. Like I would be lying if, if I, I don't think that I would be in this position if I, if COVID would not have happened, which again, it was a horrible situation that the world was put through during that time. But for me, it was, it was first and foremost, an opportunity to, to take some time for myself because there was nothing else to do. So I was sort of at that crossroads of, do I really want to keep doing this? And, you know, there's obvious things we could talk about with the way that that pandemic was handled and the, the, the craziness that went on with that, that I was just like, none of this, none of this stuff makes any sense. Like I, I can't, I can't be a part of this anymore. And so it was, for me, it was kind of that make or break. I either just continue down this road and probably just continue to spiral, or I try to do something else and make use of the time. And, you know, then it, it turned into a little bit of journaling, getting up a little bit earlier in the morning, really focusing on my nutrition, uh, a little bit more exercise and, and all those inputs started to just kind of snowball into what I feel like is somebody that's not even the same person I was a couple of years ago. Uh, and, you know, as a result, it, it just kind of put us in position now where, you know, my brother and I were kind of going through the same thing. He's, he's obviously a therapist as well. And we were just like, we can't keep doing this. What else can we do? And uh, more and more of those conversations and we're able to connect with a bunch of like-minded people like you who are, are doing things different and living life different and, we kind of just wanted a part of that. And, and now it's just a matter of, you know, basically taking all the pieces that we, we did ourselves and showing other people how to do the same. Um, and that really does start with our health, because if, if we don't have our nutrition figured out and we're not, you know, not focused on sleep, not focused on stress management and exercise, we're never going to be able to, to, you know, be the best version of ourselves for our families. And so, yeah, that's, I mean, that was a kind of a long winded answer, but, uh, yeah, that's, it's, it's been a major process. There wasn't necessarily like one point 
or a, a breaking point that I hit or, you know, that kind of rock bottom moment. It was just this, this uh, stretch of time where I just had the opportunity to, to think through life and, and just decide that I was going to start doing something a little bit different. It's so like almost difficult for me to imagine like you, okay. I mean, I've never met you in person, but I, but I've followed you, you know, for, for a couple of years now and, and, you know, seen what I've seen of, of, of your life. And it's almost impossible for me to think that, you know, you were drinking a lot. Uh, you were, you know, really focused on the news and maybe letting that control you and uh, over consuming, like watching sports and stuff. So I think that's a cool thing for people to, to realize, you know, like you can always change, you know, like you can always change your habits. Um, but, but yeah, it's still interesting for me to even like, like I said, imagine a guy like you in that kind of bad space. And now looking at you is like, okay, yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah. That, that, yeah. So just, just really cool. Well, like, well done. You know what I mean? And, um, it's nice that you're able to now teach guys that are in that place, um, that, uh, they can also change. You know what I mean? You can speak to them, you can speak their language. And I think that really helps when it comes to to coaching, like what you and your brother are doing. Yeah. And I mean, again, I, I'm not going to ever pretend like I've got it all figured out because there are definitely, there are definitely battles every day, but you know, to us, it's all about that, that don't miss twice mentality of it. Once you create a system in your life that, you know, you know, allows you to, to excel and allows you to feel good, then, you know, if it's a, if it's a bad day, a bad meal, a bad me a bad weekend, you can always kind of just fall back on, you know, who you are. And we, we, we try to really emphasize, you know, making this about who you are, as opposed to, you know, a diet or an exercise plan or whatever that is, just being able to, to fit, fit this into that sustainable lifestyle approach. Because when you do that, then you don't have to feel guilty. Um, and I mentioned self-belief earlier as well. We needed to create an opportunity for a belief structure again. I think that's really where, you know, we work with with men mainly and, um, you know, men don't have a lot of self-belief anymore. I think that the world has really kind of destroyed that for us because of kind of that rat race effect that goes on. And we need to be able to find ways to to create that belief again. And whether that's, you know, taking control of your health or putting a date on the calendar, creating some level of community, there's there's plenty of, of ways to do it. It's just a matter of of taking that first step. And then being able to keep building on that so that, you know, again, we can, we can do this for something other than, than ourselves. And maybe initially you don't even, you're not even doing it for yourself, but eventually, you know, you're, you're, it, it turns into something you were doing for your kid's sake or for your wife's sake, but then you start to feel better and you can see that you're more confident in the way you walk around and the, the conversations you're able to have and your outlook on the world. And, and from that point on, like, you know, there's nothing wrong with, with taking care of ourselves for ourselves, because that eventually, you know, spills into everybody else around us. It amazes me how people um, don't take care of themselves and especially their health. And they, you know, they might be operating, you know, to a high standard, but they, if their health is not in check, they, they could be operating like at a hundred percent better than what they are. Um, you know, like I used to work um, in an investment bank and, you know, with, with, like super smart, um, high achieving people. Uh, but they would be, you know, pretty fat, overweight, never gone to the gym. And I would always look at them. And I'd be like, my word, if you just went to the gym or you change your diet, uh, you would be like invincible. You have no idea about your potential, but, um, but yeah, they'll, they'll never get it because they, they don't necessarily realize how much their, their health and their, their excess weight and stuff is holding them back. Yeah, I mean, most people think they're operating at 90, 95% and they're operating at 60. And you unlock that potential. And it doesn't even take that long for people to realize, like, you know, it could be two or three weeks of commitment. And we see that from guys all the time. It's like they 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 do things like they change their inputs for a couple of weeks and then they introduce, you know, one of those meals that was a very common practice for them before. They're like, man, I just feel like shit. Like I, I had one meal and I feel horrible for two days afterwards. And, and they're like, I can't believe I was doing that, you know, four or five, six times a week. And, uh, it, it's just one of those things where, again, if you start the, the body is extremely resilient and it also responds very quickly to positive changes. I mean, 
we've had guys who've been able to like basically get off of blood pressure medications in in a, in a month or two because their inputs change. All of a sudden, there's like a tremendous drop in overall inflammation, and they're waking up and they're like, you know, I have low energy and I'm I'm feeling kind of dizzy, and it's like I think you need to go talk to your doctor. I think that blood pressure medication may need to go, and it's it's really cool because it's just one of those things where again, all we need, we don't, and then it kind of goes back to, you look at some of these studies of people who haven't exercised for 30 years and they start exercising or people who have smoked for 30 years and stopped smoking within a couple of years after they, they, they basically change those habits and they start exercising or stop smoking. And they can have similar blood work of people who have been exercising for, you know, 25 years because the body wants to, it's going to respond extremely positively to those changes in inputs. And just kind of getting away from this idea of, you know, I've neglected myself for 20 years or 30 years or whatever it is. There's no point now. And that's, that's just a kind of a coping mentality where it's, you're, you're much closer to being in a good spot with your health and what you realize if you just stepped into the game and, and committed for a few months. The body is truly like amazing, you know what I mean? And, um, just capable of so, so many amazing things and, and transformations and stuff. And, um, yeah, like I, I'm amazed at, uh, you know, what people can, can do and achieve, like, like I said, even in a fairly short space of time, even after murdering your body, so to speak, like for, you know, for like 10 years, um, you can turn it around quite quickly with, with not necessarily like huge adjustments, just kind of tweaks here and there, um, which I think is an important thing for people to realize, like you don't need to like drastically necessarily change, you know, everything you do, you can do it incrementally and you can start uh, sort of feeling and achieving those results um, fairly quickly. Um, and then you can do it over a longer period of time, which I guess makes it more sustainable. Yeah. I mean, we call it, you know, grab the low hanging fruit, the stuff that's, you know, very obvious in front of you that you can make some small adjustments from and, you know, maybe that takes you from, you know, very quickly, it's a, it's, it's changing a few extra snacks and being able to eat a little bit more with those first two meals of the day. So, you know, you're, you're eating more satiating foods and you're not hungry mid afternoon. And all of a sudden now, instead of having a three or 400 calorie surplus, you're at a, you know, three to 500 calorie deficit. And that's the difference between, you know, putting a pound down over the course of two weeks or losing a pound over the course of two weeks. And so it's, it's, it doesn't take a lot. It's just being able to make those small adjustments and understand what those things are. And, you know, once you start doing that, then the progress becomes very addictive. And we hear that a lot from guys too, is like, I like the way I feel and, you know, we've addressed these big problems and now like, what else can I do? You know, like this is, it's, again, it's, it's a life-changing opportunity then when you can start to, to, to really kind of grab onto those, you, you grab the, the, the five and 10% movers and you're feeling so great that now you're looking for those one and, you know, one and 2% movers. Yeah. It, it has that kind of like snowball effect, doesn't it? So yeah, man, it's amazing. I, I want to get into the, this kind of nitty gritty of that um, uh, in like a few moments, but, but just to kind of maybe backtrack a, a, a tiny little bit um, you, what transitions are always like a difficult um, phase, I guess, of people's lives. Right. You went from, you know, working as a doctor to quitting your job to then starting um, your own sort of business with your brother. Um, what were some of the sort of sticky points, niggly points, difficult parts of that transition for you? Yeah, I mean, I think initially it was trying to figure out, I mean, we, we, knew, we knew health very well. We felt very confident with it, but we also just weren't necessarily sure what what was needed, if that makes any sense. Um, there, was, there was certainly that, I mean, the, the, again, this is, I think this is very intentional as well, but our business knowledge was very limited. Um, we just, we had our doctorates of physical therapy. We went to school for a long period of time. We didn't know a lick about business. And so we needed to basically teach ourselves, you know, how to grow an audience, how to market, how to set, how to, how to have some level of sales. And so trying to develop all of those skills was probably the hardest part for us. And that kind of goes along with the writing process too. I mean, as, as, uh, as physical therapists, we're not doing a ton of skilled writing. It's, it's very, you know, clinically driven, let's just put it that way. So being able to get into that flow and, and being able to enjoy that process as well 
um, kind of all putting all those skills together and I'd say embracing those skills and understanding that like the only way for us to be really successful was to continue to learn versus just leaning on knowledge, like knowledge in one area is not going to necessarily lead to, to results. Um, and then just being able to connect. I know like, you know, you and I had, had a lot of, or we had a couple of good conversations when I first kind of got started online. And I think those were critical for me because it, it allowed me to get to know people who were, you know, similar, uh, so some of them were similar mindset, but also what, what are people struggling with? What do people need help with? And where can I fill in gaps? Because then I, I had this idea in my head of what I thought this would look like. And we've pivoted, Brett and I, probably half a dozen times already. Um, it, it might not have been like major pivots, but certainly pivots in the, in the direction of, you know, the product and the way that we're going to present things to clients and things like that. Because, you know, it, we want to continue to evolve and and bring the, the best, you know, not only the best product, but also like the best way for us to, to get guys results and to be, you know, to, to build those relationships, because those are ultimately what matter is, is being able to lean on those relationships um, and to get guys to get guys results and also to just really enjoy what we do day in and day out. So I think those are the two biggest things was um, just the relationship side of it, building new skills. And then um, just we always joke around about kind of gamifying the process of like not taking anything too seriously. Um, you know, we're trying some things right now. We're going to see what works, what doesn't work. And not seeing it as failure if that thing doesn't work, just seeing it as, okay, like how can we tweak this or do we need to once again kind of pivot and, and move on to something else? So um, that's that's kind of how I'm wired anyways. I, I like trying things and not taking things too seriously. And and I think just being willing to keep taking action. Um, you know, it's I'm, I'm not really big on, on self-help books and all that kind of stuff because I just feel like it's it creates this level of complacency that somehow we're actually doing something when there's not a whole lot of application actually going on. So we're, we're sort of, we like to fly by the seat of our pants in, in some ways and, and try things and, and just have as many conversations as we can and learn new skills and kind of throw it up all against the wall and see what sticks and, and see what we want to continue with from there. I think that's like a really important lesson for anybody that's like starting something new, especially if you are new to the sort of entrepreneur space, like don't be afraid to pivot, you know, don't be like so rigid in terms of what you think you want to do that, that you just stick to that, you know, and, and that you don't um, then give yourself these like opportunities to pivot. And um, I think, yeah, like, I mean, I remember when I started out and I left the bank, like, what I thought I was going to do and what I'm doing now is like completely different, you know? Um, but I can see like people get stuck, like, cause they're like, no, I'm doing it and I'm going to do it like this, but um, you literally can't do it. You, you literally can't do it that way. You have to, like I said, have fun, pivot, learn from your mistakes, try new things. Um, and, and it's not a failure, you know, if, if something doesn't work, it's just information. And I think that's an important thing for people to remember. Yeah. And, and again, you have to listen to your audience too, you know, like whether, whether it's, it's online or it's something, you know, just locally in your community, being able to get the feedback from people on what they like and what they don't like versus just like you said, putting your head down and, and thinking to yourself, like, this is what I want to do. And this is the only way that I want to do it. Um, it just, it really pigeonholes you and it puts you in a position where ultimately you're going to create the product's never going to be what it could be if you're not getting that consistent feedback. And, um, yeah. So I think that's one of the things that, yeah, the, where we are now with what we, and I'll just kind of be transparent with that. We, the community idea that we were running with originally was much more well-rounded. It was health and fitness related. It was working with, you know, dads and fathers, but we wanted to talk a lot more about, you know, finance and, and some of those types of things. And we just recognized that it was so broad that there wasn't any sort of like, what am I actually getting out of this? Cause it feels like it's all over the place. So, you know, we just decided we needed to lean into what we are, our, our strongest asset was, which is the, the health space. And it's allowed us to still create that community element and create the more of, I would say more like, you know, common goals, as opposed to, you know, we could have been bringing guys in with, with goals all over the place that had nothing in common at all. And, and that was going to create a lot more difficulty in, in the way that we were going to be able to, to provide value to people. So, yeah, again, that was just one of those like small lessons that we learned 
early on um, that we just needed to needed to adjust. And um, yeah, it's it's been it's been great. I think that's a common thing as well, you know, like guys like you and your brother, you know, you, you, you want to help as much people as possible. Uh, you very smart guys and you've got like a, a broad interest of things. So you're like, well, I can help tons of people, you know, so we're going to talk about finance and fatherhood and, and whatever food and gardening and, you know, all these things. But the problem is then, like you said, you, you literally, you're not capturing maybe the right audience. So the, the smaller you can refine your kind of niche, the easier it is for them to find you and the easier it is for you to know what to talk about. And, um, you know, and then maybe once you've got that sort of core group of people, then start expanding, you know what I mean? But like, get, like find your people first, make it easier for yourself and them, and then maybe expand. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head there with what you said at the end in terms of it, it made things easier on us, even though we were talking about less topics, because when you have all these different ideas floating in your head, it, it creates a little bit of that paralysis when it comes to content creation. And because you're not even really sure what you're speaking to anymore. And you just, you don't even have as a writer an opportunity to figure out what direction you're looking to go with it. So I think that gave us a lot more clarity and, um, and I think then we were able to bring more value because we had more of that clarity in place. Yeah, definitely. One of the other things that you mentioned was that you you actually had to unlearn things. So so what sort of things have you had to unlearn? <laughs> yeah, and I think I could go a million different ways with this too, but I guess I'll just speak on like the health stuff. You know, you most of the, you know, the mainstream education on things when it comes to health is is very skewed and it's very heavily manipulated into one aspect or another. And, you know, I'll, I'll kind of talk about, you know, like the red meat side of things. We've, we've been told red meat's horrible for you. And we've been throwing all these studies in our face and it's, it's, you start like actually digging into like the real research. I put something out on eggs yesterday about cholesterol and it's like, most of this stuff is, is not really supported very well. And the, the, the data we're given, the, you know, 20% higher risk of, of colon cancer. If you, if you eat red meat, as opposed to if you don't like stuff like that, if you actually look at, you know, the way that those studies were actually conducted and what the, the numbers actually mean, like, that's not the reality. Like, that's just not the truth behind it. And so, you know, I, I guess for me, it certainly made me really question and kind of follow the money trail with most of this stuff is like, who's profiting off of what they're selling here. Um, because everything we read, they're selling something and, you know, you call me, call me whatever you want, conspiracy theorists, whatever. I, I don't, I don't necessarily think that that's the case, but I think I've, I'm certainly very skeptical with pretty much everything I read these days. And, um, it's kind of allowed me to, to look back on a lot of the things that I held to be true. You know, even when I was, I, I kind of kicked myself now looking back at, you know, the heart of my racing career, my nutrition was, I, I would be my, my eating habits would be completely different now compared to when I was like, you know, in my prime racing. Um, so it really just, you know, in my head, it makes me wonder like, what would I have been capable of at 25 if I had been eating the way I am now back then? Um, just because it's, you know, the, the amount of protein in my diet was a fraction of what it is today. The, the amount of nutrient dense foods versus what I was eating then a fraction of what it was. So it's just, you know, it's, it's areas like that, that I think I've definitely un, unlearned. And then, you know, you get into like the education side of things as well. And, you know, looking at even, even when it comes to, to the, I, I guess like for an average, like 18 year old to be able to go ahead and commit, you know, I'm going to go to this school and I'm going to get myself in, you know, $200,000 in debt to pursue this career when I really don't know if this is what I want to do. Um, you know, that, that whole side of things, um, I, I certainly now question pretty heavily. And, um, but I think that's, that's part of the reason why I want to get my kids as much exposure as possible is I'm not telling them like, you can't go to college and all that kind of stuff, but I want to make sure that whatever decision that they make, that it's going to be set up that they understand fully. And they've had a ton of experience to be able to make sound decisions around these types of things, because the vast majority of, of the way that we go about life as sort of the you know, the masses, so to speak, is is really conditioned into us based on, you know, the way society has been kind of engineered. I think the more conscious you can become, the and, and then the more curious you can be about what is like spat out to you in, say, newspapers or on the news, or whatever, uh, and the more you question it, 
literally the better, you know, and um, especially like as a parent, if you can teach your kids how to question information and research information, um, you're going to probably change their lives, you know, and they're going to, they're going to really sort of um, see the world in a, in a different way. Um, that's probably like, that's probably the easiest thing we can do, you know, and um, it's, it's our responsibility to, to kind of do that. Um, so yeah, um, I, I, I totally, totally know that I've also had to unlearn a million things as well, but, um, but you touched on your racing and I'd love to just talk about that a little bit. So you've competed, uh, you know, at a very high level of Ironman, you've done 10 Ironman and three of them were uh, at Kona, which is effectively like the world championships. Um, maybe you can just tell me a little bit, like, how did you even get into doing them? Yeah. I mean, I would say I was, I was pretty naive and, you know, I, I ran uh, track in, in college and uh, a friend of mine, um, he was a decathlete. I was kind of more like a middle distance runner. And uh, we got about uh, probably halfway through our senior year. And he just said, I've got a friend of mine doing Ironman Wisconsin and uh, he wants to do Ironman Louisville. What do you think about training all summer to, to go for it? So, you know, again, at 22, I was like, why not? Like we had done, we had done a couple of sprint triathlons. I think I had done one Olympic triathlon at that point. Um, you know, those are things that don't take a ton of, of time and energy to train for, especially with as much energy, energy as we were committing already to the, the track side of things we could, aside from the swim, we could pretty much just show up and go. Um, but, uh, then, you know, we committed to Ironman and then you start realizing like, oh man, like there's a lot more time here than I thought. But I was in a pretty good spot. I had, I had gotten accepted to uh, grad school, and but I wasn't going to start until the following January. So I basically had six months where I was going to do some, some like basically bartending on the side and training. And that was pretty much my life for seven months. And, you know, it was him and I, we'd, we'd get out there in the middle of the day and, you know, we could, we could ride our bikes, you know, a hundred miles and it wasn't, it wasn't anything for us to be able to have the time for it. So um, yeah, long story short, we showed up at, at Louisville, didn't know what we were doing, had a, we thought we had a pretty good idea, but um, we didn't have any expectations. I think that was the best thing is we just wanted to finish. And um, so there was three of us and was extremely fortunate that had a good race and was able to uh, basically qualify on my first one and went out to, it was one of the last qualifiers for the year and I actually went out to Kona six weeks later. And, you know, being a 22 year old kid, it was like, wow, this is absolutely unreal. And so I was hooked at that point. And, and so then all the way through grad school, continued to train, um, raced a couple of times and then really committed even heavier after grad school and was able to get at, get back out there a couple more times um, in the first uh, three and a half years of, of my PT career. So, yeah, it was one of those times in my life that, you know, I tell my, my wife that at some point I want my kids to see me race again, and I'm certainly going to get back to it. Um, you know, maybe that'll be one of those like midlife 40 year old moments. I'll, I'll sign up again, uh, because it, it was an unbelievable time in my life. And I, I have so much credit for anybody who, you know, commits to that, that race, because it is, you know, there's, there's so much time, there's so much, you know, hard earned, blood, sweat, and tears that go into getting through the finish line. And, um, yeah, it's just, it's an unbelievable experience and an un unbelievable part of my life that I'll never forget. Yeah. Well done, buddy. Uh, and I think you sort of talking it down a little, like what, what sort of level you, you, you competed at and, and yeah, I mean the, the, the efforts that it takes, um, and the, I guess the discipline, the, the time commitment, um, everything is huge uh, to to do well at at that event. Um, uh, but I guess the lessons are, are massive as well. Like you've done ten, I don't know over how many years that was, but what what are your like sort of maybe few top takeaways from from competing at like an endurance sport like that? Yeah, I mean, I think, man, I, I've thought about this a, a few times. I mean, I think that you know, first and foremost, it to me, it kind of goes back to, I connected the dots, what I talked about earlier about being able to be alone uh, and kind of sitting in the car and listening to my thoughts. I think that was why Ironman was such a powerful thing for me was because on the bike and on the run, you're just by yourself. And, you know, you're, you're able to kind of really find that clarity and be completely present because the only thing you can do is focus on 
you know, that next pedal stroke, that next mile, that next step, whatever it is. So you have to be completely present and you can't just like, you know, kind of, it's kind of, you know, I don't want to say days off for, for a couple hours, because you still have to be thinking about hydration. You still have to be thinking about when are you going to be taking your next nutrition in? Because if you're not doing those things, then the wheels fall off very quickly when you've been out there for that amount of time. So there's always something to kind of keep you, keep you going, but you have to just stay fully present in the moment. And, um, and then just an opportunity to really be, I think grateful. I think gratitude comes out of hard things and whether it's, you know, you got people talking about cold showers and, and ice baths and all that kind of stuff. But I think it comes from like pushing ourselves too. you know, whether that's lifting weights or doing endurance sports is we, we can really be grateful for just the day and the ability to kind of push ourselves and to then be, you know, fully present. And, you know, I think gratitude and presence go, you know, very closely together. And that just, again, allows us to, to just keep a more positive outlook on life. Um, and I, I do think that's really what looking back on it, when I kind of hung things up, that was the gaping hole that I didn't really recognize for those handful of years when things kind of spiraled is because it did give me some level of, of purpose and opportunity to be present day in and day out with my training. I think sometimes you actually have to stop something or move away uh, from somewhere or, or something to realize the, the benefits that you're getting from it. You know, I think it's, uh, it's not always that you have to start doing something new to sort of grow and, and realize things. Actually, sometimes it's when you stop things that you really remember, you're like, wow, or you really, really realize, wow, jeepers, I really missed that. or that was really good for me for this and this reason. Yeah, no, no doubt about it. And I, I don't think I recognized any of those things while I was still racing, because I did find myself at the end becoming, I was, I was kind of in the chase. Like I, I was chasing that high. I was chasing that next finish line and things had gotten a bit, I would say out of line in terms of, you know, the priority side of it. And that's again, why I recognized that it was becoming more and more about, and I think that's where it gets dangerous with really any sort of, of sports endurance is it can become your identity pretty quick. And I saw that a lot with a lot of the guys that I competed with where it was almost like the first thing that they'd ever talked about was, you know, their Ironman finish time or how many they've done. And, you know, like that's still kind of going back to our earlier in our conversation too. Like, I still don't like talking about it that much. I know it's important because it, there is some level of, you know, I have a lot of, of value to be able to provide there. Um, but it, it got to the point where, again, I was, ch I was chasing and it was becoming more and more of who I was. And, when you spend that much time doing it, everybody asks you questions about it. So you kind of get tired of talking. You're going to naturally talk about it more too, because that's where most of your time is going. And so I, I needed that step back. And I think that did give me a bit more, you know, clarity on, you know, why I was doing it and why, like now, the reason I would race now would have very, very little to do with me. And it would be more about, again, I want to show my kids how dad can still do hard things and he can still push himself because I want them to do the same thing because I know how rewarding it was for me. And I think it's important as men for us to, you know, regardless of whether we're, you know, 35 or, or 65 to continue to, to show our kids that, you know, we can do, we can do difficult things and we're never going to be, you know, complacent with where we are in life. And, and so why do you think it's important for people to do hard things? Well, I think it's just because we don't see it in normal life anymore. I mean, you think about how much comfort and complacency is almost rewarded these days, and it's it's not helping people. I think it's leading to tremendous amounts of stress and anxiety because we don't have we don't have purpose. like we we're just sort of able to go through the motions with work or with school or or whatever it is. And we, we could then can come back and basically load up on cheap dopamine, whether it's, you know, food or Netflix or sports or whatever, like there's just, there's no intent behind much of what most people are doing throughout the day. And I think if we're not choosing discomfort in some capacity, then that can quickly spiral and lead to a, a very purposeless life. So it's not about, you know, my kids, I want my kids to all go out there and, and run an Ironman or, you know, be a, a crazy power lifter or anything like that. Like if they choose to do those things, great. 
but they have to see that it's it's important to lean into discomfort and to keep challenging themselves in some capacity. I think that's like a really great thing for, for people to remember, you know, like if you do hard things, it'll flow into other parts of your life, you know, and you'll probably excel at other things. Like even if it's not even, but like, you know, j- just your relationships, you know, you'll be a nicer person to be around probably because you're more energetic and, and more confident. But the opposite is true as well. Like you said, you know, if people are just um, lazy and sitting around, then they become complacent and they start eating more and they become fat and they become immobile or whatever it is. You know, you're just not really a a nice person to kind of be around. So you have to, you know, you have to keep on pushing yourself and realizing that whichever way you choose is going to feed into other parts of your life. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, dependency, or I should say comfort is kind of a gateway to dependency is the best way I can, where I can put it. Because again, it's, it's one of those areas where it can, it can spiral very quickly. You know, you can see how six months, a year of, of kind of going through the motions and all of a sudden, yeah, you've put on 20 pounds or, or now you're, you're all of a sudden on a medication. And, you know, that medication is basically your doctor's telling you, oh, you're going to have to be on this for the rest of your life because now you have diabetes or now you have high cholesterol. And so that steals your self-belief and that's only going to fuel the desire to just keep seeking more and more comfort and put yourself in a position where, yeah, things can just continue to get away from you. So, um, and again, that can, it can go 10 different ways with that, but I, I think in general, we, we've just got to get out of this mentality of, of seeking comfort. And there's no doubt it takes some level of intention to, to stand a chance in this world. Yeah. I mean, growth always happens at the sort of, edge of the zones you know and and you're only going to get to the edge of those zones if you if you sort of seek the discomfort so i think it's it's really a great lesson and thing for everyone to just keep at the back of their minds um so we've already chatted about a little bit about i guess the the uh, brother to brother men's community that um, you and your brother brett have have uh, created um can you just maybe like sort of uh, summarize what it is that you guys, um, have set up, uh, and like, I guess, why are you doing it as well? Yeah. So, you know, kind of the idea behind it is you know, we're, we're trying to really help, help dads kind of utilize taking control of their health as a launch pad for life. So, you know, whether that's, you know, initially looking to, to drop 20 pounds, 50 pounds, hundred pounds, whatever it is, just looking at it from a more holistic approach to, you know, if we can, we can help you build muscle, get stronger, feel better, you know, confidence goes up, energy goes up. And, you know, you, you're, you're maybe going to hit that number on the scale that you're looking for. And, you know, that's great, but ultimately it's going to just make every facet of the rest of our lives, you know, improve. Like I said, presence, energy level with our kids, um, being more confident, maybe, you know, generally you're going to probably make a lot more money at work if you're, uh, if you're feeling better and if you have the energy and, and your health taken care of. So, it's just kind of that springboard to be able to to just jump into improving every aspect of your life. And, you know, we we utilize a lot of accountability with Brett and I, and we, we utilize some accountability inside of a kind of a group. So it's we, we personalize everything for for each guy when it comes to their health and, and their program. Lots of guys that have injuries in the past that we help to make sure that they're not going to hurt themselves in the process. And, um, and then, yeah, just kind of leaning on, leaning on us and we're giving them constant feedback to get that snowball effect going on that I was talking about earlier. And, you know, most of the time these guys are are coming out of this program, hitting their numbers on the scale. Um, but they just, they, they look at life completely different and they realize that there's no way they're ever going back to it because they've got that sustainable lifestyle that they can lean on. And, um, many of them are are really show, you know they're all of a sudden their kids are working out with them their wives are or they're working out with them or adapting many of these things and it it just has that ripple effect that you know I think that's that's really what Brett and I wanted was we wanted to create more of a, a positive change with with families and you know the core that really builds society is the family and the kind of dads in general tend to be the ones that get left behind and if we can create more strong fathers who are healthy and confident and, and can lead, then, you know, we can, we can have a huge impact on, you know, the world as, as a whole, as opposed to just, you know, kind of looking at it through the the lens of just health. Why do you say that it's like generally the dads get left behind? What exactly do you mean by that? 
Well, I think it's just, I kind of talked about this a little bit earlier too, but you know, the, the hamster wheel, like we're, we're basically conditioned to provide and to take care of the family, but somehow it's been skewed to the only way to provide is to also neglect your health at the same time. So we need more money. We need to chase the dollar. We need to be able to keep up. And, you know, there's, there's some other factors in there when you, you get into the monetary system and all that, because a lot of that is kind of set up it's really up against the average person. And, but again, if we don't have our health, we're just not going to be able to ever get ahead. And as a result, we just stay in the rat race and steal self-belief, steals health, steals our just overall confidence level. And, you know, again, then you're, when you're 25 or 30 pounds overweight and you're just spinning your wheels, you're not going to be questioning what else could I be doing with my life? You're going to be basically just continuing to do the best you can to survive and ultimately, we want people questioning, like, what else could I be doing? Like, what, how else could I, could I lead a better life? Could I lead my family a little bit differently? And none of that's going to ever happen if we're just, you know, highly inflamed and our body's just on survival mode because of the things we're eating, a sedentary life, high stress and no sleep. Like, those are not going to put us in a position to ever, you know, question the direction of the life that we're living and the direction that we're leading our family. Is there anything that you you've noticed? Like you now have like you know groups of men and, and large groups of them. So you've got like lot, lots of anecdotal, I guess, sort of data experience. Um, is there anything that you haven't mentioned so far that you find that uh, most men are sort of struggling with? Yeah, I mean, I think in, you know a lot of it is everybody kind of blames the time element, and so we we really try to focus on. Health doesn't have to be a, a huge time commitment. It just requires a system. And most of the time, it's a lot simpler than what people think because this goes back to everything else. We've overcomplicated almost everything. And health is no exception to that, that, you know, we've got to be taking all of these supplements. We've got to be taking all of these, you know, we've got to eat a, a different food every night and be cooking 50 different dinners throughout the, throughout the year. And really simplicity allows us to have that system. And if we don't have a system, then we're going to be doomed to fail because our motivation is not going to be able to, to propel us day after day. We need to be able to lean on a system and a system creates discipline and that discipline allows us to sustain long-term. So it's, I think that's a, that's probably the, the, the biggest thing is it, it doesn't have to take that much time and it, it, it just requires a little bit more simplicity it doesn't mean we have to sacrifice. Doesn't mean we have to make you know be hungry all the time and things like that. That it's it's a lot easier to be healthy. And in most cases, it's it, after a few weeks you realize it's a lot easier to be healthy than it is to be unhealthy. Um, when you start seeing the drastic differences in the way you feel and, and the way that you know you're able to present yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The community elements. How have you sort of found that? Uh, what have been the benefits of that? for your guys? Yeah. So, I mean, again, I think it, it comes back to, it's, it's great to be in the fire with other people who have common goals. And, you know, Brett and I have, we've kind of gone through this process already ourselves, but you know, it's, it's just like anything else. If, if you hear it from somebody who is more of that coach or, you know, wherever that, that title is, it's, it's helpful to hear. But it's really helpful to hear somebody who's been in the program for three months talking to somebody who just started and they're like, just do this, like do what they're telling you to do. Stay consistent. I'm down, you know, I'm down 35 pounds in three months, like, and I feel fantastic. Like that element of it, like Brett and I can't create that that has to be from somebody else. And so, you know, because we work with guys for six months, you're alongside guys who've been at this a while and who've gotten a whole bunch of wins from it. And they're able to talk about, you know, what work, what's worked for them on travel and what's worked for them to navigate holidays. And so, you know, we've, we've got all these different tools and, and different ideas that we can put together with Brett and I, but there's a lot of stuff that we've put in our toolbox because we've, we've learned it from other guys because we're not traveling every week for work, you know, but we're hearing this has been successful for these three or four guys when they've, you know, when they've been on the road for, for the week and, um, and just, again, being able to, to connect that I'm not in this alone and I've seen this work and it, it kind of shows them that like, okay, you know, this guy talked about falling off the wagon for, for a week while he was on vacation 
and he's still down 40 pounds since he started. So I've had a couple of bad days. There's no reason that I can't, you know, be successful and I need to stop feeling sorry for myself and just get back to it again. That's such an important thing. I think for, for anybody that is coaching anyone is to realize that this is actually like a partnership and it's a, it's a two way street, even though you're the coach, you can still learn almost just as much from the person you're coaching as you can maybe help them with, um, which it sounds like what you guys are doing, you know? Yeah. And, and again, like they, they ask great questions. So, you know, we have different calls throughout the week where, you know, Brett and I will kind of unpack some different ideas, but a lot of it is Q and a, and if one guy has a question, generally there's probably 10 other guys that they maybe haven't asked it yet, but it's something that's going to be helpful for them. So the, that whole iron sharpens iron mentality of we don't have to have all the answers. We don't have to come up with all the questions. We just have to listen and and take that feedback and then be able to, to try to, the, to the best of our ability, you know, communicate that to, to everybody else so that it can become, you know, as well-rounded of a product and something that also helps as many people as possible uh, along the way. I've seen like some of the reviews and testimonials that you guys have posted and, you know, it's, I mean, it's, it's life-changing stuff for a lot of these guys. How does that make you guys feel as, you know, brothers that are running this group? Yeah. I mean, it's, I, I can't tell you how exciting it is for me to like get on like every morning when we do our check-ins, I get pumped. Like my, sometimes my, my wife, uh, she probably hears me like, you know, like, yell or, or makes you know say something out loud pretty uh, pretty loud and she'll come in and she'll be like what and i'll just say you know so and so he's he checked in and you know he's down his first 20 pounds or whatever it is and so it just it's it's extremely rewarding and that's the biggest difference now versus what i was doing before is the guys that we're working with they want it you know they're they're committed to this process they're they're taking our feedback and they're applying it and versus in most cases, a lot of the clients we were working with before in the physical therapy realm, most of them were there. They weren't paying for it because insurance generally was. They were there because their doctor told them to, and they weren't really in the mindset where they just wanted it bad enough. And, you know, these guys want it. They want to make change. They're tired of the way that they feel and the way that, you know, they, the way that they look, and they just want something different. And they're coming in and they're putting in the work and we're able to just kind of be a vessel that supports that. And so it's extremely rewarding. And I, t I think I mentioned this, maybe it was offline. It, it's the best part of what we do. Like it's working with clients. It, it's far surpasses, you know, the social media side of it. It's, it's it, like you said, it, we're, we're able to kind of use some skills and, and some give guys feedback to you know, change their lives. And there's nothing more rewarding than that. I can imagine that, you know, the, the guys that say drop 20 pounds, they, it's not even necessarily about the weight. Of course it is right. But it's their shift in mindset and their outlook on life and maybe their relationships that change. Uh, I can imagine that must be you know, some of the best sort of stories and things that you guys witness. Yeah. It's almost like a light bulb goes on for them where they just like recognize that I can do this. I feel good. It's sustainable. And it, it allows them to, you, you can almost tell in the process when people reach the point where they're like, there's no question in my mind here that I can do this for the rest of my life. Like there's, there's this shift of a little bit of reluctant doubt to, I've got this and I'm going to continue to, to make progress here in the months ahead. And no matter when this thing ends, like I'm not going back to what I was doing before. And so it's like, once that, once that moment happens, um, you can, like you said, you can almost see that confidence come on. Um, and some of the calls, you can see those guys start sharing more. They're, they're trying to like help some of the other guys and, and talk about, you know, what's working for them because they, they recognize that what they've done they're going to be able to sustain. And now they want to start helping other people. And so, you know, that's, that's the part we can't even really like put a value on it because realistically we want these guys to like take care of their health and then sort of light that torch and then go light a bunch of other people's torches because, you know, we, we don't expect to work with, you know, thousands and thousands of people. We just want to be able to help the people that are, that we're able to kind of, you know, directly contact and then allow them to just go have that ripple effect where, 
you know, their families are eating better. They're working out together. They're, they're going to, to work and, and to social events. And they're talking about the things that are working for them. And hopefully, you know, start to, to change some of these, these mindsets and show people how easy it is to, to take care of their health. I think the ripple effect is just huge. You know, that is like, like you said, you, you working, say with, uh, with one guy in your community, and then he's like, he, his wife now, she, she sees the change in him. She's like, I also want to do that. You know, what are you doing? And then it's like the kids are like, well, we also want to do this, dad, you know, like, uh, and so, you know, you're not necessarily just helping one bloke, you're helping a whole family. And then who knows how that sort of then sort of ripples after that. And I think that's, uh, you know, that's huge, but that's, uh, I guess that's, it's obviously life-changing for the individual, but also, you know, you, you're, you're, you're changing, I guess, um, much larger communities um, for the better as well. So yeah, epic stuff, man. Just the, you, you, you talk about nailing the basics. Okay. Like um, what's a bit of like practical advice for, for say some of the, the stuff that you guys teach, um, you know, because, because I mean, obviously, you know, you, not everything works for everybody, but there are certain things that do work for, for a lot of people, you know, what, what are some of the things that you advise? Yeah. So, I mean, it, it, it looks obviously a little bit different for each person, but, you know, foundationally, the vast majority of guys are definitely not getting enough protein on board. So being able to, it's not about, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to pound a, a giant ribeye at dinner to kind of make up the difference. We need stable blood sugar. So if we can keep blood sugar stable throughout the day, we're going to set ourselves up in a position where we're going to have less cravings. We're generally going to snack a lot less and we're going to allow our body to burn fat more effectively. So we talk a lot about insulin resistance and, and how to overcome that because, you know, the, the data kind of shows 80% of people have some level of insulin resistance going on. And so we can keep blood sugar stable, you know, for us, that kind of typically starts with for each meal, 30 grams of protein being the minimum. And if we can do that all by itself, we're going to probably close to double what most guys are eating coming into, you know, working with us, you know, 40, 45 grams of protein in a day, not going to get the job done. You're just going to feel low energy, a whole bunch of extra empty calories. And that's going to be a recipe for, you know, that, that blood sugar roller coaster that we always talk about. So it's kind of a, a, a starting point right there with most guys. Um, and the resistance training is, is huge. It's if we're going to be in a calorie deficit, we need resistance training. Otherwise, the body sees no reason to hold on to muscle. So we're not chasing a number on the scale. You know, we're going to get to that number on the scale, but that's not our desired purpose. Our desired purpose is to lose fat, not lose weight. So if if we're losing muscle and it allows us to then get to the number on the scale, I'd argue you're in a worse position. So you know, you you might you might lose lose weight a little bit slower because our goal is to stimulate muscle at the same time. So. Because as we add muscle, it just, it's basically like stoking the fire of your metabolism. You know, every pound of muscle you add is going to burn basically an extra, uh, an extra pound of fat every single year. So, you know, you can think about if you, if you add five pounds of muscle, that's like, you know, 17,000 calories that you get to burn just existing throughout the year that you otherwise wouldn't have access to. So, you know, if we can, something as simple as, okay, I want to drop 20 pounds. If we can add, if we can drop 25 pounds of fat, and add five pounds of muscle in the process. Now the scale says you've dropped 20 pounds, but from a metabolic health standpoint, you're in a completely different position, having that extra five pounds of muscle on board to go along with, you know, dropping 25 pounds of fat. So that's, that's critical is any calorie deficit. We need protein. Uh, we need resistance training. doesn't have to be five days a week. Ideally two to four is usually going to get the job done. If the program is in a good spot, um, also again, you don't need to be in the gym for two hours at a time. So, you know, most of our workouts are 30 to 40 minutes, two to four days a week, get in, get out. Um, you know, you're, you're basically doing some level of damage to your muscle when you're in there, which is, is necessary, but excessive damage. It just allow it basically takes additional time for us to recover from. So there's kind of that sweet spot that, that changes for each guy, especially if we're comparing somebody who's 35 versus somebody who's 60 or 65. You know, the program we're going to build for those guys is going to look different because the 65 year old is going to take a little bit more time to recover, even if he's eating the same, you know, the same uh, nutrition, uh, it, it's going to take a little bit more time. So built in some more recovery, you know, staying focused on those types of things. So those would be the, you know, the, the keys 
well, obviously we need a calorie deficit. It doesn't have to be crazy extreme. I mean, a 500 calorie deficit over the course of a week every day is going to help you lose a pound every single week. So, you know, somewhere between, uh, you know, somewhere between 500 and, and 800 is, is generally a good spot. Uh, we don't have guys count calories. We kind of do do all that stuff for them, just sending over pictures of their meals and whatnot, try to keep it really, really simple. Um, and, you know, we kind of teach people how to build their plate as opposed to be uh, kind of being connected to, you know, plugging everything in on an app that most guys just don't want to do and don't have time for long term. So we try to take a little bit different approach to that than than being stuck, you know, on that calorie tracker. Yeah, I think you're going to get like much better results, um, much better sort of inputs by everybody, like I said, by just keeping it simple, you know, and because uh, that's where I think a lot of people fall off the boats is like, like you said, they, they're using apps and they're having to weigh their meals and, that, and this and that. And it just becomes like you almost get overwhelmed, you know, at like what you have to do to be healthy. So the, the simpler you can make it, um, the better and the more engaged the people are going to be and the more long term, I guess, their, their results are going to be as well. Um Something that I've kind of like noticed that feels like in in society at the moment is there's a high level of kind of anxiety. And I know you wrote about this recently. Like what what do you sort of advise people to maybe be a little less anxious in their lives? Yeah, I mean, I think it it ties into a lot of the things we've already talked about here with nutrition to me needs to become a lot more of a focus. I think of of food as an input and we need to take control of those inputs versus, you know, eating to eat, we need to eat a little bit more to fuel ourselves. And if we're doing that, when we have that less inflammation, you know, the brain's going to get inflamed as well. So if, if we have all that extra inflammation, we're going to feel anxious, you know, we can't necessarily feel the same aches and pains that we can in our joints from inflammation. But our brain kind of perceives that as stress and anxiety, and, and it's just not going to function, you know, quite as efficiently. So being able to fuel ourselves, um, I would say would be number one. And then, you know, taking that time to to disconnect. Um, I, I always think, you know, all of the stuff that's been technology has advanced much faster than the human brain has. And as a result, we're not conditioned. Our brain is not ready for all of these constant inputs day in and day out. And when we're constantly on social media, watching TV, listening to music, listening to podcasts, there's just this over or information overload, so to speak that I think it just creates a lot of the stress and anxiety, you know, we, we, we deal with because it's just so much so fast and there's never a time to just allow the brain to rest um, and, and find that, find that margin. So those would be my first two. And then no doubt, you know, movements and relationships kind of fall in there. I would say, you know, after that, is if, if we're moving, if we're taking walks outside in nature, getting sunlight, um, you know, all that stuff is extremely powerful for our health. And, and then, you know, the, you see a lot of stuff out there right now on like the blue zones and they like to talk about the things that they eat. But I personally think it has so much more to do with the community aspect of it is they live less stressful lives because they have deep connection with people around them. And if you can have deep connection and you can, you know, have those, those core group of people, you know, it's not necessarily going to be 2000 people on Facebook that are going to give you that sense of community. It's going to be a smaller group of people that you, you know, truly are able to go to when you struggle. And, you know, when life happens that we really need to be able to, to kind of lean on. So I think that sense of community goes a long ways. Um, and that's just to be able to keep that positive outlook. You know, lots of, lots of value there. I was wondering, like, is there anything that you'd add um, for people that maybe struggle to sleep, like to what you've just sort of suggested sure. um, for people that are anxious? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the the nutrition piece would be first there because again, if you're eating quality nutrition, going back to, I mentioned like trying to get to three, three solid meals a day that keep your blood sugar stable is if you're snacking late or, you know, you find yourself kind of using pick-me-ups throughout the day, or eating a late meal, those things are definitely going to in, interfere with quality sleep. And then I, I'm definitely a big fan of magnesium. I think magnesium is a very powerful tool that it's something our body needs. And it's something that we were previously getting in our diets in a much, much, you know, higher concentration. But as you know, soil quality has gone down, um, you know, less whole foods that we're eating throughout, uh, less of those kind of root vegetables and things like that in our diets, 
or just not getting as much of that stuff. And that plays a huge factor in, in just general relaxation and recovery. And if we're not getting it consistently, then it's something that I think, you know, supplementing is, I don't talk a lot about supplementing. I think most of it is overdone. But I do think magnesium is, is, an, is a very helpful uh, supplement that's also very, very inexpensive. So the stuff that's out there, you know, you're not generally going to gonna find one that's significantly better than the others, which that's part of the problem with supplementing is it's, it's so heavily marketed that it's almost like, you know, you're, you feel like you've got to buy a $200 product because you, you actually can trust what's in it versus some of this other stuff. Whereas magnesium, you know, there's not a lot of money to be made cutting corners with that stuff. So the majority of the stuff that's out there is going to be pretty solid. Mm, yeah. Solid man. Really solid advice there, but uh, just as I guess, as we sort of come to an end, yeah, like what, what, what are you kind of most excited about uh, going forward? Um, and do you have anything like cool coming up any any new products or groups or anything like that? Yes. I mean, we're, we're continuing to, to kind of build and, and Brett and I are, are finding, you know, different ways to continue to, to provide value. We're, we're working directly with guys in the group uh, any, you know, any day. And, and we're, we're still, we're taking guys every day with that who are, are stepping up and, and taking back control of their health. Um, we are going to be looking at some different different ways, and some, we're, we're going to be running a couple master classes to kind of give people an opportunity to get to know us a little bit, kind of what our system looks like, and then um, we're also you know kicking around the idea of, of maybe our first product next year. So you know for some guys they don't necessarily not really interested working directly with us. So you know we want to be able to provide some additional value for those guys that want to be more like self guided. So taking, you know, all the information that we share uh, day in and day out with clients and, and being able to put something together that, you know, is available for, for anybody who's looking for um, some consistent, you know, just basically, like I said, a self-directed course that is going to give them everything they need to be successful. Mm, that's, that's exciting. Uh, and uh, yeah, like, I guess also quite a big project and and cool for you guys to do. So, so yeah, man, I'm looking forward to, to seeing that, but I was just wondering um, if people wanted to get a hold of you or find out more about you like where's the best place to go yeah so uh, on our website uh, brother to brother you, uh, dot com, uh that's that's kind of our our main hub right now um where you can you can uh, join our email list on there um brett and i share a ton of, of free value we try to we put a lot of energy into that newsletter so there's we try not to keep it you know superficial we try to make it very value packed uh on tuesdays and fridays when it goes out um, a great way to kind of get to know us, a great way to get some some free value when it comes to to health and, and leading your family. Um, so I would definitely, you know, hop on that. And then from there, um, you know, if you, you guys have any additional questions, you can always DM me um, and also uh, reach out by email uh, with any questions there as well. But the newsletter, uh, again, I, I feel very strongly in, in what we put out every week. And I think that's a great way for, for people to get started. That's really cool. I mean, newsletters are well, wow, they 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 take a lot of um, time and effort to uh, put together, you know. So, uh, you know, I'm sure that just the type of person you are that I know, like it's it's probably full of like super, you know, amount of value, and um, you know, people mustn't take that sort of information lightly because um, they do take a, a long time to to put together and craft. So, um, yeah, definitely something cool to sign up to. And then my last question uh, for you, Chris, is uh, what does being ridiculously human mean to you? I think it means, uh, to me, I would say just stepping away from average would be the first thing that kind of steps or comes into my mind is it, it unfortunately doesn't take a lot to be ridiculously human in this world or to be perceived as ridiculously human in, in this world because the vast majority of people are going to kind of stay in their comfort zone. So, you know, I think it, you know, you, you can be a few months away from being ridiculously human, at least in the eyes of your peers, uh, day in and day out, just by, you know, stepping up and, and focusing on yourself and building yourself day in and day out. And so, um, yeah, that, I think that'd be my, you know, initial thoughts on, on the ridiculously human uh, side of it. And, uh, but I, I'm just really grateful to, to be on here, brother. And I, I really do appreciate the the time and, and the invite. No, man, it's, uh, it's been so awesome, Chris. I just wanted to say like a, a huge thank you. You, you have a special type of energy, bud. And, um, you know, your smile, like it just sort of, um, is infectious. And I guess it's, it sort of 
gravitates people towards you. Um, and, and then of course, just adding all the, the knowledge and, um, experience that you have on top of that. Um, it's just been a like absolute pleasure to chat to you. And I'm sure that the guys in your group must be just benefiting hugely. And, you know, it, it, it I'm sure it just sells itself, you know, because of the type of person that you are and, no doubt, no doubt your, your brother is, is very similar in, and in, in probably in the way he, you know, his energy and he holds his own energy. So, um, just thanks so much, man, for your time. I know you're a busy guy, dad of three, um, just to, uh, yeah, just to, you know, speak your wisdom and share it with, with me and my audience is, is amazing. So, uh, keep, keep it, keep up with everything you're doing, but it's amazing. You know, like I'm looking forward to, to seeing you sort of challenge Zuby and those sort of guys on Twitter with your, with your following. So <laughs> well done, bud. And, and thanks again for, for everything. Well, I, I appreciate the kind words, man. And um, yeah, it's, it's been a pleasure and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to be here. I'm grateful to, to have this platform and um, yeah, looking forward to, to, you know, what the, the years ahead have in store for us. And the best part is we don't really know what that is. And we're just going to kind of keep taking it one by one day at a time and trying to provide value and help, you know, help as many people as we can. So it's, uh, it's, it's truly a, a joy to be able to wake up every day and be able to have conversations like this. Sweet. Thanks brother.